Greetings to everyone present. My name is Ankit Mulotra. I'm the co-founder and president of the Jindal Society of International Law. It's my honor and privilege to be able to start our lecture series for this spring semester. It's also a lecture series with which I will close my presidency of the society. So it's an honor and a privilege. We start off with a lecture which is extremely important and also very recent. But before I will introduce our speakers and also our series, I would like to say a few words about the series and also the Jindal Society of International Law, which was started in the 18th day of November in 2020 and was inaugurated by the Herbert and Rose Rubin Professor of International Law, Professor Jose Enrique Alvarez, and the university's Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, the coordinator of our society, Professor Dr. Weston Kowalski. The purpose of the society is to increase student interaction with international law and promote research-driven opportunities and skills and initiatives to bridge this lacuna which existed during the pandemic and has become something quite fascinating. And we're so grateful that we now stand in the steps of history of also now putting together a book for which one of our speakers is kind enough to, to give a chapter. Our colloquium or, or the series for this semester offers a compendium of scholarship from the academy and professional experience from the bar. Over the past year, the society has hosted over 100 renowned foreign universities, uh, speakers from such universities, members of the International Law Commission, International Law Firms, United Nations, the Institut de Droit International, the World Bank, the Hague Academy of International Law. Through its previous series, it has also tried to encourage, promote, and give an endeavor to students to study the different contours of international law through the speakers who covered and addressed respective areas of research with their expertise and their years of practice. Given that vast ecosystem that we explore and the engagement of international law in it, the society aimed to study the fragmentation and fertilization of the various disciplines in the ecosystem of public and private international law. Over the years, the society has become a quorum of thought-provoking discussion due to its engagements with international law. Thus, as a result, the spring lecture series, which we kickstart this, this evening, is important and understands the law and its challenges from broader, different, and differing vantage points. Acknowledging international law as a creation of states, it is also important to understand and appreciate the social sciences and humanities that have played a key role in shaping the law. Thus, a broader study becomes critical and crucial for us. Through the series, it is, it is hoped that one will develop a deeper understanding as put in Philip Jesup's magnum opus, A Modern Law of, of Nations, an introduction. He says, and I quote him here, as long as the international community is composed of states, it is only through an exercise of their will as expressed through treaty or agreement or as laid down by an international authority delivering its power from states that a rule of law becomes binding. To speak on this topic and a very important issue, we have Professor Christina Watt, who is the co-chair of the Paris Agreements Implementation and Compliance Committee since June 2020. She's also the facilitator of negotiations of the procedure, procedures for the Compliance Committee in the Paris Agreements Rulebook of COP24. She's also an expert consultant for the UNEP and is related to the Norwegian uh, government on affairs related to the environment, and was present as a delegate of the Norwegian Committee at COP26. So we request her and we will be delighted to hear her thoughts on this aspect and aspects related to COP26 and international environment law. We also have Dr. Eileen Gildis, who is a research fellow at the World Trade Institute at the University of Bern. Her experience and research interests lie in climate change, human mobility, disasters, and human rights. She obtained her PhD from the World Trade Institute, University of Bern, and also has degrees from Istanbul, Canada, and the United Kingdom. We also have amongst us Professor Dr. Amran Rosenkras, who is the founding dean of the Jindal School of International 
uh, of the sorry the Jindal School of International of Environment and Sustainability. He was educated at Princeton and Stanford. And at Stanford, he held several important roles, which were important and integral to student relations and affairs. He also taught environment and natural resource policies at Stanford to undergrad students for 20 years. His courses were cross-listed, and he also was very close to the President Johnson's secret task force on government organizations. He also con conducted a set of hearings on urban problems to then Senator Robert Kennedy. He co-founded, in fact, funded the Pacific Environment and International Environment NGO in 1987, which was led by him for a decade. Amongst us, we also have Professor Tatiana, who's 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 shared her recording with us because she is she's unable to join us because she starts her elective course today. It is also someone who's teaching very very fervently and enthusiastically on environment and international relations, which I do hope to attend from next week. With those words, I now invite Professor Christina to start with the elocution, and then we'll move on to the other speakers. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, Ankit, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you so much, Ankit, for your very kind words of introduction. But thanks also to the Jindal Society of International Law and the Jindal Global Law School for arranging this lecture series. And I, I completely concur um, with you that it is very important to, to strike a good balance between you know, the academic discourses, but also getting a real good uh, um, understanding of, of the processes outside our respective um, scholarly institutions and have a very good anchoring in in reality and in that in that regard i commend the the spring series um and and thank you very much for inviting me it's it's a great pleasure and a privilege you asked me to share some reflection on cop 26 which happened to be last year in in glasgow and i'm very happy to do so you mentioned that i was there in in several functions as a member of the norwegian delegation but also as co-chair of the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee, which is a standing body um, under the Paris Agreement established in the Paris Agreement. Fairly new, not many know about it. That was something we tried to change in Glasgow, and hopefully we did a little bit. Now, what I'm going to do, I don't have a presentation. I'll just talk to the audience. I'm very much looking forward also to you know any questions or comments you may have. What I'll, I'll be doing is I will do three things. First of all, I'll say a couple of words about why COP26 was important or why it became so important. Uh, then second, I'll say a little bit about the outcomes from that meeting. And then uh, third, I'll, I'll share some more personal reflections on, on those outcomes. So let me start with why COP26 was important. Well, COP26 was actually many things that were just put together under this heading of COP26. It was the 26th meeting of the Conference of Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change. It was the third Conference of the Parties to the Paris Agreement, and it was the 16th Conference of the Parties to the Kyoto Protocol. So these were the formal negotiations that, of course, happen usually every year. But in addition to it, it was also a meeting of heads of state that came at the very beginning of the two-week session and, and stayed for a day or two and gave very high level or highest level statements, but they were not necessarily linked to the formal negotiation. It was like a, a different level on uh, niveau of, of the COP. And the third element was, of course, the civil society uh, events in the green zone and the blue zone where stakeholders and civil societies had, had their what is called side events, which you know, slowly become actually the main event of the COP and the negotiation kind of a side event. So all this together was COP26, and it was um, an event with enormous expectations attached to it, um, expectations that I personally feared in the beginning would never be able to, to be met because it was uh, uh, quite a significant um, a task to deliver on these expectations. I'm, I'm very sorry here. I have a lot of light coming in and I have uh, functioning sh shades that, that I cannot steer. So if it gets really bright, then I, I apologize. Um, let me say why the COP was so important. It was important basically because there was no 
none of these uh, international meetings in 2020 due to the pandemic. That was the first time ever in 26 years or 27 years of the Conference of the Parties that there was no meeting. And that was, of course, very confusing to many negotiators to not meet. And also in the meantime, there had been very many um, online meetings, but you can't really find global consensus on Zoom or Teams. That doesn't work. You can discuss things, but you just can't agree. Um, and another aspect that may uh, raise the expectations to the COP was, of course, the um, uh, publication of the first um, uh, part of the um, IPCC sixth assessment report that happened in August last year, so prior to the COP, um, and which already put the climate science on a new level, saying that you know 1.2 degree of warming is uh, without doubt uh, happening. Um, also, in that last summer in Europe and in Northern America, we have seen the impacts on climate change in societies where you thought, you know, that planning laws uh, had established really a buffer uh, regulation against these impacts. But no, you know, if you saw whole villages in Germany just being washed away and the wildfires in, in different parts of the world, it became very clear that climate change is very close to us and has severe impacts wherever you are. And we are looking into a world that is becoming more and more unplanable unless we do something about the causes of climate change. So that's another reason for why, you know, the expectations to the COP were, were sky high. And another reason yet was that there, as we all know, under the Paris Agreement, parties have the obligation to communicate nationally determined contributions, NDCs. Every five years, they're supposed to progress in their level of ambition, but currently the current level of ambition isn't high enough. It probably leads to something about 2.7 degrees warming. And that was the result of a um, synthesis report prepared by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Secretariat, which came out uh, prior to the COP. And of course there were expectations that parties would increase their level of ambition in their NDCs. Um, two more aspects that raised the expectations of the COP was the United States was back. The United States and new President Biden had reintroduced um, the United States under the realm of the Paris Agreement uh, earlier in 2021. The United States was fully back as a full party. And of course, there were expectations of how the United States as the biggest uh, economy and the second biggest emitter in the world would, would act. And the last element, which I think was maybe one of the most decisive elements for the importance of the COP was the UK presidency and partly Brexit because it was a chance for the UK to present itself on the international stage as the convener of an international meeting of this size and also as of the convener of a successful outcome, which was themed keeping 1.5 degrees alive or keeping 1.5 alive. That was the, the headline of the COP. So given all this, of course, the expectations were uh, sensationally high and the fears were equally high that that may not deliver. But as I said in the beginning, in the end, I think the COP delivered very well. So let me go to the second part. What, what did the COP actually deliver? And I'll focus on the, the formal <laughs> negotiations and not on the state, heads of state and civil society engagements. So one part of the three elements um, of the COP. So what, what did the COP deliver, um, or be better, the CMA, actually? I think one of the most important points that the COP delivered was the finalization of the rulebook for the Paris Agreement. A fairly technical elements, um, but it's absolutely crucial important. Um, the Paris Agreement is basically the only international treaty that we have that tackles or is intended to tackle climate change on a comprehensive scale and scope. And having the rules in place for the effective implementation of the Paris Agreement is absolutely crucially important to make it work. We had the big set of rules adopted in Katowice in 2018, but a couple of rules were missing. And these were crucial rules for the processes under the Paris Agreement. Um, 
and also important to close the ambition gap that we um, identified in the beginning, because most of the processes under the Paris Agreement have not yet been kicked in motion. We know the NDCs now quite well, but the rest, the reporting and the global stock take is yet to come. We haven't seen it yet. And the rules, uh, especially for the transparency framework, were absolutely crucial. So which were the elements that were put in place? I guess we've all heard by now, uh, of course, the, the rules and uh, guidelines for Article 6 for cooperative approaches under Article 6, both in a bilateral manner under Article 6, Paragraph 2, and the international mechanism that's established under Article 6, Paragraph 4. And states had not been able for three years to agree on these rules since 2018, but they finally managed to find consensus in, uh, in Glasgow. And that's very important because in general, the Paris Agreement builds up to unilateral action where each party on its own puts forward an NDC, a nationally determined contribution. But Article 6 widens this scope from unilateral action to cooperative action where states can actually work together and cooperate in raising ambition, but also states and private entities can work together and uh, uh, um, implement projects to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a very important aspect of the Paris Agreement and an aspect that is intended to increase uh, uh, mitigation ambition. So important issues were resolved and that, that part of the rule book was agreed. But in addition to Article 6, there were also very important decisions taken on the um, uh, requirements for reporting under the enhanced transparency framework under Article 13 of the Paris Agreement. And reporting is absolutely important because we all know that the, the, the numbers in the NDCs, the goals and targets uh, that parties set for themselves are not legally binding. But in the absence of that legally binding element, it is so much more important that parties are actually open and transparent about how they implement and achieve their NDC so that everybody can look at it, that there is peer pressure by other states, but also civil society has access to this information that is supposed to go through the enhanced transparency framework. So the modalities for common reporting tables, it sounds terribly technical and boring, but they're absolutely crucial. Those, those tables where parties actually have to fill in all their details uh, reporting on, on how well they implement and achieve their NDC and also their national inventory reports and so forth. There are also common tableau formats and there is an outline for the technical expert review because each single report that parties have to put forward every other year from 2024 on, onwards will have to be re reviewed by an independent technical expert review team and for those teams now the outline for their reports also was adopted in CAT in Glasgow. Technical, maybe boring, but absolutely important. And the third element that belonged to the uh, rule book is the agreement or kind of agreement on common timeframes. Parties are now at least encouraged <laughs> to have five-year timeframes. That wasn't clear until now. It isn't entirely clear from now on, but there is an encouragement, an indication that NDCs will have a time limit or will last for a time period of five years from 2025 onwards. So these are important elements of the rule book. In addition to the rule book decisions, there were more elements that were agreed by the parties, which I call kind of booster elements to the Paris Agreement. They're not formally part of the rule book, but they're still given a significant normative push to the implementation and the further development of parties' policies and laws in implementing the Paris Agreement. These are not found in the you know, more detailed decisions, but they are found in what's called the cover decision, the, the first decision of the CMA, one CMA three, uh, as it will be when it's numbered, it's not numbered yet. Um, these elements are not legally binding. A decision by the COP is, or CMA in this case, is not legally binding, but they give very important indications of where we are headed. And here we have very significant signals from Glasgow. 
One important signal is the importance of 1.5 degrees as uh, related to well below two degrees. As we all know, in Article 2, we find both of these temperature goals and in the negotiations of the Paris Agreement, a lot of focus was on two degrees or well below two degrees. And only in the very end, 1.5 degrees came in because small island developing states insisted on that. And then President Obama struck a balance to, to, to agree to get it in there. But it was kind of a, a, a you know, concession kind of thing that made it into the pay. But now, which is really interesting, now the focus, the political focus shifts more and more towards the lower range of, you know, how where temperature increases should be uh, a whole uh, health, and that is 1.5 degrees. That's a very important signal from Glasgow. So 1.5 degrees is definitely alive and very much so. A second important element is the clear reference to the IPCC <laughs> report. That should be a given. But if you've been in these negotiations, and for example, if you've been to Katowice, where parties were asked to um, welcome or note the 1.5 degrees report from the IPCC, and it was a big debate and discussion, it is very, very good to see the very straight, straightforward recognition of the IPCC report, um, the, the six assessment report um, and even putting into the decision the concrete numerical target and timelines of getting to net, net zero by, by 2050. This also has a further um, implication for implementing Paris because it anticipates the timeline for getting to uh, net zero emissions from mid-century to 2050 and even then also anticipates getting you know below zero from the end of the century to 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 mid-century so we suddenly see a, a an enhanced timeline more urgency more urgent action needed to implement uh the the temperature goals of the Paris agreement um so these are really important decisions which kind of uh, I call them booster, but they, they strengthen and underline the processes of the Paris Agreement and the Paris Agreement's rationale in, in, and, and logic in a very fundamental and important and, and clear way. Um, finally, some more additional outcomes relate to um, this upcoming year or this year which we have now started where we have a request to all parties to review their NDCs and submit updated or second NDCs by uh, the next COP, COP27 in Egypt in Sham El Sheikh. That was kind of unexpected that it would apply to every party, not just to them who did not uh, submit uh, enhanced or updated NDCs last year but no if one is supposed to go back and check you know lift all the stones and look whether they cannot do any better until uh, this the end of this year which is very an important um, ambition push to keep 1.5 alive um, there is now also an annual synthesis report of the um, the sum of parties um, uh, uh, combined goals in their NDCs. That was not the case until now. So every year there will be a synthesis report so that we know where we are collectively every second, uh, every, every year. Um, also, we have now a mitigation uh, work program under the subsidiary bodies. And that's quite interesting because the negotiations never really had a particular mitigation work program. It was more the information needed for the NDCs, but nothing that focused squarely on mitigation. It's not quite clear what they're going to do in this work program, but it's an important one. Um, we also have a closer relationship now between the NDCs and what's called the long-term uh, greenhouse gas uh, um, development strategies, LTS, which are mid-century as long-term strategies, and they need to align with the NDCs, or the NDCs need to align with that mid-century strategy, which is important to create some more um, long-term policy making and not just those five-year uh, shorter time uh, slots. Two more things. Uh, one is the closer relationship between um, 
so far different silos in international environmental law, biodiversity, nature protection, ocean protection, and climate change. And we find a much closer integration and recognition of the integrated um, addressing of uh, protecting nature for climate purposes, protecting climate change in order to put nature, but also the role of oceans where we now have an annual ocean and climate dialogue. So this breaking down of the different silos is particularly interesting, I think, also from an international law perspective, because we really have to see these different things um, in, in conjunction and not in different international regimes and, and silos. And finally, as we all know by now, because media kind of zoomed in on that particular aspect, is of course the end of, um, of fossil fuels. Um, which we just saw the spare beginning of um, by recognizing that uh, uh, coal um, may have to be phased down and fossil fuel subsidies, um, if they are ineffective, have to be phased out. Um, there was a lot of focus on that by media. I don't think it's uh, it, it did right or did justice to the importance of what parties agreed on in the end, because the signal is much more important than the particularities of how it was formulated. And the signal is that this is the beginning of the end of fossil fuels, even though it just mentioned coal and not oil and gas, which it probably should have, <laughs> not just coal. And it mentions facing down instead of facing out. But we know where the general direction is headed, and, and that is an important signal. And I think the, the one on fossil fuel subsidies is probably even more important uh, for its implications of finance policies, economic structures of, of countries um, to come. So to wrap up, and I think I'm getting close to my 25 minutes, Ankit, but you know, you just let me know. Um, what are my few reflections? I think, um, as I said, you know, being surprised by the rather strong and positive um, outcome of very difficult negotiations is that it gave a very strong support consolidation booster to the Paris Agreement. And that, in my view, is crucially important because we need that agreement. We need to implement it effectively. Uh, it is set up in a way that brings everyone together and everyone together in, in uh, um, aligned five-year steps to where we collectively worldwide need to go. So the finalization of the rule book, the additional elements that I mentioned, the consolidation of the processes that, that we have, that the, the, the rules for the, the enhanced transparency framework, this is a really important signal of all the 196, I think, parties to the Paris Agreement saying, we stand with this agreement. We mean seriously the Paris Agreement and we will implement it. But also these additional shifts, these normative shifts within the agreement from well below two degrees to 1.5 degrees, from mid-century to 2050, from you know five-year NDCs to also including long-term strategies. These are important normative um, pushes that increase ambition and, and that increase urgent action, but also um, uh, action with a, with a longer time frame and have long time planning horizons. And what are the implications of this for law and policy development? I think we will see more and more states adopting national climate laws and also specific sector laws and let's transport agriculture, building and so forth. But the strong push and the strong support for the Paris Agreement will enhance, uh, I think, more uh, legislative measures by, by parties in their national jurisdiction. And that's where they become you know, judicially reviewable and enforceable. It's not on the international level. The Paris Agreement Compliance Committee cannot enforce that, but domestic courts can. And, and that is where it's really important to stimulate these legal changes. But we will also see, and that's a very strong message from, from Glasgow, hopefully changes in finance, um, investment, uh, commercial policies and regulations because of that link to coal, because of that long-term strategy, and, and also because of um, a, a, an, an article of the Paris Agreement, which kind of flew under the radar, which is Article 2, Paragraph 1, Literacy, which uh, talks about 
consistent uh, um, 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 development flows with, with climate resilient development and low greenhouse gas emission, uh, finance flows with low greenhouse gas emission and climate resilient development, which is on the same normative level as the, the, the temperature targets, and, but hasn't been used that much so far in policy making or in um, uh, adjudication. And that's the last point I want to raise. We're all aware of that wave of climate litigation worldwide. And, uh, you know, we, we see it happening almost every week, every second week is a new case being launched or a decision being taken, which is breathtaking. If you want to follow this development, it's a full time job. Um, but it is also <laughs> it's also interesting to think about what from these Glasgow outcomes, maybe even more, you know, stimulate more litigation. And I think that, you know, real expectation of enhanced NDCs at the end of this year is an interesting one. But also those long term strategies, uh, what are parties planning to do in 2050 and not just in the next five years, it's going to be really important to reach the 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 global targets under the, the Paris Agreement. Um, we also see, of course, the, the science-based litigation where many um, courts uh, directly refer to the findings of the IPCC. And this is now, as I said, squarely anchored in that decision from Glasgow. Um, and it might make it easier for innovative judges and courts to draw that link to, to climate change. And while we are speaking here, you probably know that the scientists and policymakers that support the IPCC are meeting at the same time in Switzerland, I think, to work on the uh, report from the second working group, uh, which also will be part of the sixth assessment report. And that report from the second working group will deal with mitigation. And we will probably see very inconvenient truth coming forward from that report about how fast and how rapidly and drastically the world needs to act in order to stay true to the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. I think I stop here and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Well within time. I hope we can say that about our future as well. But until now, for at least for now, let me invite Ireland to, to uh, share her presentation and her perspective on this. Uh, so Ireland, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ankit. Let me just share this. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope that the slides are visible. Is it okay, Ankit? Okay, yes, perfect. Um, so I'm very pleased and honored to be taking part in this wonderful panel today. My special thanks to our organizers, moderator, and their wider team. Perhaps our audience had the chance to look at the IPCC's most recent report on the physical basis of climate change, which Christine also mentioned. This report was a great reminder of how reflecting on COP26 and the future of climate change law is not only necessary, but that it's urgent. From states to businesses to courts to us as individuals, we all need to familiarize ourselves with the adverse impacts of climate change and a discussion on the integrated and comprehensive policies and laws to pave the way for a sustainable future. So with that ambition today, I'll be zooming into a particular adverse effect of climate change and that is on human mobility. With this focus, I'm also hoping to avoid repeating Christina's well thought and very articulated deliberations. I'm also aiming to capture one of the booster elements of COP26, which Christina um, put it as such, I think. This is also important for the LTCs Christina mentioned, which are the long-term greenhouse gas development strategies. So in the Glasgow Climate Pact, which was decided during COP26, states have acknowledged, and I quote, that climate change is a common concern of humankind. Parties should, when taking action to address climate change, respect, promote, and consider their respective obligations on human rights, the right to health, the rights of indigenous peoples, local communities, migrants, children, persons with disabilities, and people in vulnerable situations, and the right to development, as well as gender equality, empowerment of women, and intergenerational equity, unquote. And in the Glasgow Climate Pact, states have also reaffirmed their duty to fulfill the pledge of providing 100 billion US dollars annually from developed to developing countries. 
The climate finance delivery plan meeting the USD 100 billion goal was agreed to scale up financial resources to achieve a balance between adaptation and mitigation. Now, these pledges are particularly important for the work of the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage of the UNFCCC and its task force on displacement. Increasing access to sustainable and predictable climate financing to avert, minimize, and address displacement related to the adverse impacts of climate change has remained as a challenging issue. Now, let's take a step back. Let's talk about the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage and its task force on displacement. In 1990, the IPCC recognized in its first report that, I quote, the gravest effects of climate change may be those on human migration, as millions are displaced by shoreline erosion, coastal flooding, and severe drought, unquote. This statement was especially a catalyst for international cooperation on human mobility in the context of climate change. In 2013, the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage of the UNFCCC was established with a mandate to enhance knowledge and understanding of comprehensive risk management approaches and action and support, including finance, technology, and capacity building, as well as to strengthen the dialogue, coordination, coherence, and synergies among relevant stakeholders for loss and damage. And two years later, in 2015, states parties to the NFCCC mandated the executive committee of the Warsaw International Mechanism to establish the task force on displacement. Now, this task force was entrusted with the development of recommendations to avert, minimize, and address displacement related to the adverse impacts of climate change. And after about two years, the final version of the non-binding recommendations were delivered during COP24 in Katowice, and here the COP welcomed the recommendations. And since then, the task force has been building upon its recommendations and the work stream of the Warsaw Mechanism to enhance cooperation and facilitation in relation to human mobility. Now, at this point, you might wonder, what is human mobility in the context of climate change? What does it even mean? So let's unpack that term a little bit. There is now an emerging international consensus that the term human mobility refers to three types of movement. Migration, which is generally understood as voluntary movement, displacement, which is generally understood as involuntary movement, and planned relocation, which generally refers to the resettlement of groups of individuals with or without government assistance. Simply put, changes in the global climate amplify the risk of disasters, both in their intensity and in their frequency. As air and water temperatures increase, sea levels are rising, precipitation is heavier, uh, droughts and wildfire seasons are longer, storms are supercharged, and wind speeds are greater. And in this context, people are on the move. And this movement is itself arranged along a, what I call a multi-axial continuum. So from internal to cross-border, from temporary to permanent, and from planned to unplanned. So let's make human mobility in the context of climate change more concrete, right? So here are some numbers. In 2020 alone, a series of devastating disasters internally displaced 30.7 million people globally, which amounts to two thirds of total displacement. This figure is from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, the IDMC. As many as 216 million people could move within their own countries across six regions of the world due to slow onset climate change impacts by 2050, according to the recent report of the World Bank Group. More specifically, three regions in the world, namely Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America, could see more than 140 million internal climate migrants by 2050. 2050 is also the year in which 300 million people are forecasted to be flooded by rising sea levels, as the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres reminded us in a speech from three years ago. So what did the task force and displacement recommend states to do about this? The non-binding recommendations made by the task force on displacement include formulating laws, policies, and strategies at all levels, including the community, national, regional, and international levels, that reflect the importance of integrated approaches to averting, minimizing, and addressing displacement related to the adverse impact of climate change, as well as in the broader context of human mobility, enhancing research and data collection to better map human mobility related to the adverse impacts of climate change, and integrating human mobility challenges and opportunities into both national planning processes, 
and the relevant policy agendas. Protection is explicitly referred to as a part of the recommendation to continue developing and sharing good practices. And here the task force encourages the protection of affected individuals and communities within existing national laws, as well as international protocols and conventions where applicable. However, the recommendations fall short of explicitly laying out a conceptual framework for protecting affected persons and communities at the international level. Now, it's my view that an international mechanism that serves the purpose uh, of protection is pivotal to address human mobility in the context of climate change. And here's why. Human mobility in the context of climate change is a complex problem. It emerges from the actions of and interactions between multiple actors. It has multiple dynamic and interconnected variables. It occurs in the conditions of scientific uncertainty and evolving scientific knowledge. And finally, it's planetary in scope and intergenerational in its impacts. So it's possible to think of human mobility in the context of climate change as consisting of a cluster of interrelated problems which span across legal, economic, political, social, environmental, scientific, ethical, demographic, and security concerns. Simply put, and I think Christine also said that, no one is immune to the consequences of climate change and disasters. Whether we, they face flooding, wildfires, drought, desertification, or sea level rise, all countries will need to adapt to a warmer world due to the long-term and potentially irreversible effects of climate change, present and future generations will increasingly grapple with the decision of whether or not to move. And um, climate injustice also holds for uh, human mobility in the context of climate change. Those that have contributed the least to the problem are those that are impacted the most. And since human mobility in the context of climate change is a complex planetary and intergenerational problem, it can be managed only if all states cooperate in promoting an international minimum standard for the treatment of affected persons. And in my upcoming book, I'm advocating for such an international standard. I believe that this standard should have three pillars. The first pillar is about the application of the principle of non reformat which grants protection against return to the country of origin. I argue that the content of the standard, in other words, the requirements to grant protection against return to the country of origin must be further fleshed out by states based on the input of non-state actors, especially the affected persons themselves. The second pillar is about preventing future displacement. While some of the impacts of climate change will be irreversible for millennia, such as sea level rise, others can be slowed, and yet others can be reversed through ambitious mitigation and adaptation strategies. And this pillar then calls for rigorous climate action and disaster risk reduction and preparedness. The third pillar is about the facilitation of safe, orderly, and regular migration in the context of disasters and climate change. This pillar focuses on opening up legal pathways for migration. Facilitation means to make an action or a process easy, or at least easier. And when applied to migration, it means to make migration easier and to lower barriers to mobility. Now, the idea of facilitating the movement of persons as an adaptation strategy to climate change represents one of the key and novel storylines. Migration as adaptation can be seen as a strategy to moderate harm by transforming people's ability to cope with environmental changes. It can also lead to the exploitation of beneficial opportunities, such as seeking employment in an expanded network of labor migration options. Thus, facilitating migration can enable two kinds of adaptation. In situ, in which people try to adjust their local systems to adapt to climate change by relocating internally within their countries, and ex situ, in which people look for opportunities across borders, whether temporarily or permanently. And in this sense, lowering barriers to mobility can emancipate individuals and improve their living conditions, as well as their enjoyment of human rights. Now, this is our cue for zooming out. As I have mentioned earlier, the IPCC's recognition in 1990 on the impact of climate change on human mobility was a particular catalyst for international um, cooperation. And as a consequence, different processes under international law have been addressing this issue. Now, looking at the UN Security Council, it has held open debates and area formula meetings on the issue of climate change, international peace and security since 2007. Although the open debates have not led to the adoption of resolutions on the topic, 
The Security Council has expressed in a presidential statement in 2011 its concern for possible security implications of loss of territory of some states caused by sea level rise, in particular in slow, small low-lying island states. In October 2021, there was an area formula meeting on sea level rise and the implications for international peace and security, which inspired the open debate in December 2021, where the Security Council failed to adopt a resolution casting climate change as a threat to international peace and security. Looking at the UN International Law Commission, it has decided to include in its program of work the topic protection of persons in the event of disasters in 2007, following the challenges raised by the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami. On the basis of eight reports submitted by the Special Rapporteur Eduardo Valencia Ospina, as well as the comments provided by states and other relevant actors, the Commission adopted the draft articles on the protection of persons in the event of disasters in 2016. The UN General Assembly took note of the articles, and since 2020, the UN General Assembly has been elaborating on a legally binding convention on the basis of the articles. And um, since 2019, the UN International Law Commission has been studying the topic of sea level rise in relation to international law and established an open-ended study group on the topic, which is co-chaired by ILC members Nilfer Oral, Patricia Galvo Teles, Bogdan Aresu, Yacuba Sise, and Juan Jose Santoloria. The study group is examining sea level rise and maritime boundaries, statehood, and the protection of persons. Patricia Galvalteles is currently preparing the report on the protection of affected persons by sea level rise, and the final report of the study group is scheduled for 2025. Now, turning to the UN Human Rights Council, it has adopted several resolutions addressing human rights and climate change since 2008. These resolutions play a pivotal role not only in the interpretation and application of international human rights treaties to human mobility in the context of climate change, but also for the negotiations under the auspices of the UNFCCC. For instance, the first mention of human rights in the context of UNFCCC was made in 2010 with a reference to a resolution adopted by the Human Rights Council a year earlier. Moreover, the Human Rights Council has pioneered the creation of key special rapporteurs who have conducted studies which have been contributing to the understanding of the topic. For instance, the work of John Knox, the previous Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, has led to the identification of framework principles on the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. The recent report of Cecilia Jimenez de Mari, the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons, has shed light on internal displacement in the context of the slow onset adverse effects of climate change. And in 2021, the Human Rights Council recognized for the first time that having a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is a fundamental right and created a new special rapporteur on the protection of human rights in the context of climate change. Now, the treaty bodies of international human rights treaties have also been playing a very important role in interpreting and applying the human rights obligations of states in the context of climate change. In one particular communication, the UN Human Rights Committee had the opportunity to interpret the non-reformal obligations of states towards persons affected by climate change. This communication was initiated by Mr. Ione Tesiosa, a Kiribati citizen living in New Zealand at the time. He alleged that by removing him to Kiribati, New Zealand had violated his right to life under Article 6 of the ICCPR. This case is the committee's first ruling on a communication by an individual seeking asylum from the effects of climate change. In his communication, Mr. Tesiosa claimed that the effects of climate change and sea level rise forced him to migrate from the island of Tarawa in the Republic of Kiribati to New Zealand. He argued that the severe impacts of climate change in Kiribati triggered the non reform obligation of New Zealand not to send him back to Kiribati. In his decision dated 10 January, 2020, the committee found that Mr. Tesioso's removal did not violate his right to life under Article 6 of the ICCPR and that the non reform obligation of New Zealand was not triggered in this particular case. Nonetheless, the committee recalled that environmental degradation can compromise the effective enjoyment of the right to life. It further said that without robust national and international efforts, the effects of climate change in receiving states may expose individuals to a violation of their rights under the ICCPR, thereby triggering the non-reform obligations of sending states. 
Furthermore, given that the risk of an entire country becoming submerged underwater is such an extreme risk, the conditions of life in such a country may become incompatible with the right to life with dignity before the risk is realized, said the committee. Now let's turn to the UN General Assembly. It has adopted two global compacts in December 2018, the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration and the Global Compact on Refugees. These compacts are legally non-binding. Nonetheless, they are extremely important for human mobility in the context of climate change because they reflect the most recent understanding of states on the topic. The Global Compact for Migration has 23 objectives. And under objective two, it dedicates the only thematic cluster in the whole document to natural disasters, the adverse effects of climate change and environmental degradation. And it calls really for two things, strengthening resilience and preventing displacement to help people stay on the one hand and preparing for planned and regular migration to allow people to move out of harm's way on the other. The Global Compact on Refugees designates environmental factors as drivers which interact with root causes of refugee movement. It also draws attention to avoiding protection gaps and enabling all those in need of international protection to find it. Now, with this statement, states have endorsed um, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees interpretation that under the Refugee Convention and its protocol, the refugee definition does not expressly cover those fleeing natural disasters, environmental degradation, or climate-related factors. However, situations of nexus dynamics where the refugee criteria interact with disasters or the adverse effects of climate change may arise, which may entitle people to international refugee protection. States and non-state actors have been participating in the implementation of global compacts since their adoption. And some of these implementation measures relate to human mobility in the context of climate change. For instance, Peru is developing um, a specific national plan of action to address climate-related drivers of migration. Belize reported that it's integrating human mobility and planned relocation into its climate strategy. Guatemala stated that it is integrating human mobility considerations into its national plan of action on climate change. Fiji established the Climate Relocation of Communities Trust Fund in 2019, which supports the planned relocation of communities affected by climate change. The Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, Ministers of Foreign Affairs adopted the Protocol on the Free Movement of Persons in 2020, which includes provisions allowing people affected by disasters to enter and stay in eight member countries. The US established a Task Force on the Climate Crisis and Global Migration, and the task force prepared a report for the president in 2021 in which it recommended to the government options for the protection and resettlement of individuals displaced directly or indirectly from climate change. The Global Mayor's Task Force on Climate and Migration was launched in 2021 to address the impacts of the climate crisis on migration in cities and to accelerate global responses. Mauritius pledged to integrate approaches to avert, minimize, and address displacement related to the adverse impacts of climate change into relevant national processes, including the process to formulate and implement national climate adaptation plans. The EU adopted a new strategy on adaptation to climate change in February 2021 and a disaster risk reduction program for Africa, the Caribbean, and Pacific states. Furthermore, it expressed commitments to more reliable, comparable, and timely data for evidence-based action to improve the lives of refugees and their hosts, including through direct support for disaster preparedness and responses, and greater attention to the impact of climate change. And finally, the UN Network on Migration, which is a body created to facilitate the implementation of the Global Compact for Migration, has established the thematic priority of migration in the context of disasters, climate change, and environmental degradation in 2021. It has submitted a statement to COP26 and closely co collaborates with the UNFCCC Task Force on Displacement. And this brings us back to COP26 and the UNFCCC. I think that I tried to take you on a ride with me during the speech um, to introduce you some of the processes addressing human mobility in the context of climate change. And the picture we created is by no means exhaustive, but I hope that this picture is able to familiarize you with some of the international cooperative frameworks, as well as some recent national legal and policy frameworks on this topic. 
And um, with this brief introduction to this topic, I'm curious to learn more about your views on this. Do you think that the future of climate change law should do um, do you think that, yeah, climate change law should do more to address human mobility in the context of climate change? And if so, how? What are your views on the fragmented approaches to address this issue? I think Christine also mentioned in her speech that we should break silos. Um, can we break the silos with respect to the impact of climate change on human mobility as well? And do you also agree with my argument that we need an international response based upon three pillars to address this complex planetary and intergenerational problem? I'm looking forward to our discussions and thank you all for your attention. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ireland, for your presentation. It was quite enriching and uh, I do encourage everyone to, to follow her YouTube channel, which breaks down these complex uh, topics in a very simple and very friendly manner. Now, Professor uh, Tatiana could not be with us, but she's been kind enough to record and share her presentation, which I will now play. And I hope this is uh, audible and also visible, because uh, if not, then we'll have to pass on. But in the interim, I do request our participants to share their questions and queries and comments in the chat box, because after this, we'll follow it up with questions. But I'll just play this and request uh, Eileen or whoever can to just confirm if this is audible and also visible. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the panel. Uh, I will talk about the results of uh, Glasgow Climate Change Conference and I will talk here about uh, the conclusions of it. So which, uh, what can be drawn uh, from this conference? Uh, it, uh, the, confer the Glasgow Climate Change Conference convened after a year-long postponement due to the global COVID pandemic and uh, parties adopted the Glasgow Climate Act Pact as a result, which is a series of three uh, cover decisions, which uh, the goal, uh, which provide like a narrative to the conference of the parties. Uh, so for the first time uh, in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, there, is, there was finally made a reference to phasing down unabated coal power. The unabated coal power is uh, using of coal, burning coal, without using technology to uh, reverse uh, CO2 emissions and to diminish CO2 emissions. Uh, so there was also idea about phasing out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, so to stop fossil fuel, subsidizing fossil fuel. The uh, COP26 was done in continuation of the Paris Agreement from 2015 with uh, the purpose of uh, Paris Agreement was is to keep the global warming uh, by the end of the century uh, under 2 degrees Celsius and preferably under 1.5 degrees Celsius. This goal is not totally lost because of the um, what is currently like if we currently however the uh, story to 2.7 celsius global warming by 2100 if the way continues like now and if the national determined contributions by different countries will be fulfilled uh, so the COP26 was a progress to large extent. Uh, so uh, even though with all my uh, admiration for uh, Greta Thunberg, who called uh, COP26 just a greenwash, it's not entirely greenwash. It was an outcome of a quite bitter struggle, a uh, struggle between the conflict of interests, various interests, one is a general interest of humanity as such to uh, finish, uh, to phase out coal, uh, unabated coal, as soon as possible and preferably by 2030. This is a goal, for example, of Extinction Rebellion, of Fridays for Future movement. Uh, however, the, um, we have to, uh, to deal with the uh, fossil fuel lobby with a coal lobby which uh, has uh, at the end the agreement has been watered uh, down su sufficiently but not totally. 
Uh, so uh, there are still, uh, I would still see it as achievement because there are clear dates when uh, entire use of coal, unabated coal, will be finished as such. And this is uh, by the mid of this century. So by 2050, uh, the, the most countries like EU, uh, United States and uh, uh, Britain uh, actually uh, set the national contribution to phase out coal by uh, 2050, uh, completely unabated use of coal emissions. And uh, for the countries like uh, China and India and Russia, it would be to reach carbon neutrality in 2060 and 2070 for Russia. India also got a goal of 50% renewable energy by 2030. So these are clear dates, these are clear promises, and if they kept, uh, this will essentially improve the situation with uh, global warming. So I would not uh, regard this outcome as not as a failure. It's not a failure, but it's a compromise. It's a compromise because you can see the struggle of interests, uh, the uh, fossil fuel lobby and uh, the uh, environmentally oriented public, which um, this is not only for COP26, this is also the case for many other conference of the parties, previous one, which resulted in a, a lesser agreement than expected. So when Sharma, the president, uh, said his disappointment that at the last moment China interfered and uh, the phasing out coal was replaced by phasing down. Uh, this disappointment is completely understandable and I also share this disappointment, but I still uh, think that the hope remains. So what it will result on the legal perspective for the countries, it's probably the strengthening of national regulation and finding out more efficient regulation for carbon markets, uh, for the uh, fossil fuel industry, uh, stricter measures, more investments in green uh, industry, uh, in green energy and renewable clean energy like solar energy for India mostly. So it's difficult to predict at this point what would be exactly the uh, legal consequences. So I want to uh, quote um, Gifford Pinchot who was the U.S. Forestry Service and advisor to, uh, at that time, President uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who actually said that a real environmental policy requires that the parliament should be independent from any private party interests. Any partisan interests should not be uh, impact the parliamentary decisions. And this problem, which was um, announced by Gifford Pinchot, and that's what Teddy Roosevelt tried to implement, it still remains a problem until today. So we can see that the COP26 reflects the existing conflict of interest in the world. It reflects the global situation, so the outcome, the compromise which was achieved, I think it's better than not having this compromise. So it is a cautious step forward, which increases our hope for climate stabilization and avoiding the worst consequences of global climate change. Well, um, concerning the more philosophical implications, it's the becoming of the Anthropocene, the maturing of the Anthropocene. Because if we mean under Anthropocene, the humans at the helmet, uh, the human species becoming a dominant force on uh, which shapes the geological process on the planet, uh, uh, it's important that Anthropocene was not destructive, but it was constructive and it was maintaining the boundaries of the biosphere. That human activity was not violating the boundaries of the natural balance, uh, like gases, uh, circulation, 
uh, water circulation in the atmosphere that it remained as unchanged as possible and as close to equilibrium as possible. So uh, the COP26 is expression of Anthropocene going and becoming Anthropocene, so in formation. I mean not the Anthropocene, uh, the negative part of it, which is being environmentally destructive, but the constructive part of Anthropocene, uh, which means that we manage to control our power, human power and human interference with nature in such a way that it will be as little disturbing for the biosphere and for the ecosystems as possible and make the human flourishing compatible and consistent with the flourishing of the biosphere. I believe that this would be eventually the outcome of the process of Anthropocene, but the question is to minimize sacrifices and to minimize victims and disturbances for the nature, species, loss. We are now in the middle of six mass extinction. So, okay, thank you for your attention. See you. So, uh, we we'll now proceed to the questions and I do have a couple which uh, motivated me to, to, to organize this and uh, I'll start with Professor Christina and then uh, and then I'll also share a few questions for you which you can take and then we can have a discussion amongst ourselves. So first being the, the, the enhanced NDCs and their involvement uh, and uh, uh, how they can be made more uh, sharper in terms of the ratchet mechanisms which are used and also, very quickly, if you can somehow relate this to Ecocide, which is another project of yours, and how that, that has been involved in this, and uh, uh, perhaps you can touch upon that. And uh, we'll, we'll have you first, as I acknowledge that you have another appointment lined up after this, and we can discuss later on with Ireland uh, for questions with her. Um, thank you, Ankit, and I do apologize that I have to move on in about uh, seven to ten minutes. But I, before I answer your, your important question, I just wanted to uh, um, thank Eileen um, for, for her fantastic talk. It was really um, uh, very, very rich and deep and, and uh, a really important uh, topic to, to deal with, and, and I, I very much enjoyed it. Um, on the NDCs and the, the ratcheting up, um, it, it is actually quite interesting what happened in Glasgow with this um, request uh, to, to parties to come up with yet another updated version of their, their NDC or, or even the second NDC, we will we'll have to see this because it wasn't quite expected. As I said earlier, it was expected that those that had not submitted an updated NDC would be invited to do so, but that it would apply to everyone is a sign or is a recognition of that the, the general level of ambition is too low. It is recognizing the, the, the synthesis report, which points towards 2.7 degrees rather than well below two or even 1.5 degrees. We're still far off the, the mark, but it is also very important because as you, as you know, the Paris Agreement has been criticized of you know not being ambitious enough or something like this because parties and the these are not ambitious enough yet, but in my view, this is the whole point of the Paris Agreement. The whole point is to get parties from they are where they are now over these steps to where they need to be. And that's where we need those, those processes under the Paris Agreement to kick in and these, this peer pressure to kick in to get Paris, uh, Paris parties <laughs> to where they need to be. And this is the first sign that it actually works, that it actually works. And maybe it is also something that those that criticize the Paris Agreement most strongly I want to go back and think about it because what we actually need is everyone to support it and use it as a mechanism to push up and to pull up ambition rather than to talk it down as, as some seem, seem to do. And that's always something that <laughs> gets me very angry because we have nothing else. We have no other international agreement. It is the only one and it is designed in a way to, to, to enhance ambition over time and it should be used. 
by everyone. Um, on ecocide, uh, that, well, that's a bit of a <laughs> different topic, um, but an, an interesting one as well. I don't want to link it to the NDCs. I think that would stretch it a little bit too far. But what ecocide is attempting to do, and I'm, I'm sure the, the audience may have heard about um, the, the initiative, the idea of uh, trying to include a fifth international uh, crime in the Rome statute. It's a statute that's established the International Criminal Court in The Hague, uh, where we so far have international crimes that are of concern to the international community, but these only concern human harm, like genocide, crimes against humanity, and so forth. But the, the severe destruction of the environment, especially during peacetime, is not part of the jurisdiction of the ICC, the International Court of Justice. But given the dire strain of the environment and given that many actions uh, have very severe uh, impacts on the environment, the idea is that it's about time to criminalize those actions that lead to severe and widespread or long-term environmental harm. Now, uh, as I said, linking this back to the NDCs is, is very, very difficult, but the question is what might ecocide mean in the in context of climate change? And I think here, linking up to this general um, uh, message that we are seeing, we're looking at the end of fossil fossil fuels and large scale fossil fuel projects that may have the potential to, you know, releasing significant amount of greenhouse gases may be something that over time could fall under the, the purview of, of an environmental crime. But we're not there yet and we will have to see how the legal development may or may not look like in, in the years to come. But it's certainly something that that parties to the Rome Statute and, and everyone else that could also be included in national jurisdiction could uh, consider and think about. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor, for your expert comments. And uh, just the last question, and then we can perhaps close as well with respect to what Eileen said, the reference made to the global, uh, sorry, the Glasgow Climate Pact and fragmentation of studies, uh, which perhaps could be said that is responsible for the watering down of responsibilities is this an analysis which is accurate in terms of saying that okay just because there are so many discussions about it then perhaps we can use that and use that in order to water down the responsibilities upon states and uh, is this a line of thought which they follow because climate action climate justice in some sense is the need of the hour and um, in that sense, the ratchet mechanism becomes perfect. So does the Paris rule book. These are just some. These are just some thoughts that I was curious about. Island, so is yours. And after that, perhaps we can close. Sure. Thanks, Ankit. Um, I think I concur with Christina's two points: international cooperation to have possibly legally binding, if not based on a voluntary basis, reporting. And two, based on that, translating um, our climate disaster, refugee, migration, human rights, and so on, other policy and legal frameworks um, into domestic law. And I think that's the future. And that's where I see us going. And that's where I see real possibility of bringing about change. And I think the Paris Agreement is great because it does make it obligatory for states to submit their NDCs and there is a reporting mechanism and that's how we force our countries to um, translate those um, policies into domestic law. We ask our governments, we force them to say, hey, you need to adopt a climate um, action act. You need to pass this from the parliament. That's that. There's no other way to do this. And I think that's where I really see the strength of the Paris Agreement. And I also genuinely couldn't see um, any other way that all the countries would have come um, sit down and agreed upon a um, upon an international agreement on climate change. I genuinely don't see them, you know, I don't see another Kyoto Protocol changing anything. Um, so in that sense, I think it's a very smart move. And with the global compacts for migration and on refugees, we see the same sort of a um, policy making structure being or, or law making structure being replicated, actually. It's what the Paris Agreement has done that we see is being done in the fields of international migration. Right. So they, states will never sit down and write uh, and, and decide on something internationally binding, legally binding on migration. But instead, what they have done is to create this legally non-binding framework. And there they have to report on how they're you know, implementing those commitments. And that's where the strength is, because then we can come in and say to our governments, hey, look, you have endorsed the global compact for migration. You have to actually incorporate 
um, issues with respect to human rights, human migration, displacement on your climate and disaster um, frameworks. Have you done that? You haven't, so you have to act. Um, so it calls for a lot of activism, that's true, but we have to earn this, this um, you know, we have to fight for this. <laughs> Unfortunately, human rights haven't come into existence without people, you know, fighting for those rights. And it's the same with climate change. We have to fight for these rights. Um, yeah. I think, I think that's put very, very beautifully and very succinctly. And I think there's, there's no better way to kickstart this, this series and also uh, the discussions on such important issues. I thank both our speakers for taking our time for doing this and also for sharing their expert thoughts. And also to Professor Tatiana, who could not make it, but was kind enough to share her expert thoughts on video with us. I also thank our participants for joining this discussion. We will update you regularly with our upcoming lectures and our future discussions. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, professors. Thank you so much. And Tatiana, uh, Island, thank you so much as well. Thank you.